Welcome back as we continue our journey through the book of Salvation is from the Jews by Roy Showman. We're privileged to have Roy here with us again. So thanks for joining us. Uh, last time we stopped partially through chapter 4, the messianic idea of Judaism. And tonight we're going to pick that up again. And uh, let's start with, uh, again, some of the messianic prophecies that uh, were fulfilled um, by Jesus in the, uh, both the Old Testament and the uh, Talmudic writings. Sure. Uh, well, uh, obviously one of the Messianic prophecies that has the highest profile, especially in the Catholic world, is that he would be born of a virgin. And um, the Hebrew word in the, that appears in the Old Testament in that prophecy, that the Messiah would be it's a prophecy that alludes to the Messiah that he would be born of a virgin. It's Alma. And one of the arguments that Jewish um, anti missionaries, which are essentially Jewish apologists who try to talk Jews out of believing in Christianity, make is that the word Alma simply can simply mean young woman. And therefore, it's spurious that Christianity claims to be the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy because Jesus was born of a virgin, because I was never you know, part of the messianic expectation. Now, there are at least two responses to that. One is, it wouldn't be much of a miraculous sign <laughs> that he would be born of a woman, <laughs> of a young woman. But the more telling is that, is that a few hundred years before Christ, the Old Testament was translated into Greek because by that point already, um, a, a, a very, very large number of Jews no longer lived in, in the Holy Land, but lived in the rest of the Greek world and had lost their familiarity with Hebrew and their ability to understand the scriptures in Hebrew. So the rabbis got together and, uh, in Alexandria and did a comprehensive translation of the Old Testament into Greek, which in Jewish teaching was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that that translation itself was infallible and miraculously produced. In that translation into Greek, the word that Alma in that prophecy is translated to is a word, a Greek word, which unambiguously means virgin. So centuries before Jesus ever came on the scene, essentially the Jewish authorities had, had kind of dogmatically declared that the correct translation for that word in that prophecy was virgin, not just young woman. And in Jewish scripture study, wasn't it the case that if you did come into a, a particular scripture that uh, perhaps could have been mistranslated or misinterpreted, you would go back to the Greek as sort of the first uh, point of reference to go back to check the Greek to see what the Greek had said? Uh, it certainly is one of the resources that was, av was available to... So they just many. choose to ignore that? And um, much, much of Judaism has taken a turn of defending itself against the claims of Christianity. So there are a lot of places where the Jewish position has become a position of, of kind of, um, of defense. So I might as well use that to kind of go into another aspect of all of this, which is there are very, very many prophecies in the Old, Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. Um, but there are also many Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that one could claim that Jesus has not fulfilled. In particular, those, we know them as Christians, we know those prophecies as Christians to be second coming prophecies. Because a number of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament refer to his, um, to the, to when Jesus will come again. Um, for instance, um, um, the, um, in, in um, uh, let me, let me, uh, uh, turn to that in Zechariah, where um, the prophecy is, um, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, and so forth. I mean, there are these incredibly 
glorious images of the Messiah coming and as, as a conquering hero and changing the entire state of the world in a kind of very visible way, a, a very visible, glorious victory. And of course, we see reflections of that in the New Testament where um, some of the accusations, uh, the disappointment in Jesus was that he wasn't you know, the, the military conquering um, you know, king messiah. Now, so, so Christian, uh, Jewish apologists or Jewish anti-missionaries will say, see, Jesus didn't fulfill all those prophecies, but in fact, they're not even being true to Jew, Jewish teaching because the Talmud already recognized these two sets of prophecies. So there was one set of prophecies in the Old Testament that talked about the Messiah as coming to suffer and die and take away the sins of the people, like Isaiah 53, uh, the suffering servant. And there was another set of prophecies that predicted him as a conquering hero. And already the Talmud tried to wrestle with this and determined, oh, the answer must be there are going to be two messiahs. The first messiah who comes will come to suffer and die, and the second messiah who comes will come as a conquering hero to put an end to the world as we know it and an end to any strife and make the kingdom of God victorious over all the earth. Um, they saw this as two messiahs coming, one first and one later. We as Christians know it, of course, to be two comings of the same messiah, the first coming of Jesus, which was as the um, suffering messiah, and the second coming of Jesus as the victorious messiah. And it's very telling to me that in the Talmud itself, the messiah who comes to suffer and die is referred to as Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah the son of Joseph, and the conquering king Messiah is referred to as Messiah ben David, Messiah the son of David. Because in the New Testament, whenever um, Jesus' humanity was being pointed out, he was referred to as Jesus' son of Joseph, right? Isn't this the carpenter's son? And whenever his, um, his, his um, uh, divinity was being pointed out, he was, you know, Jesus, son of David. He was the Messiah, son of David, right? So oh, son of David, he only... When he comes to reestablish this kingdom of David, this is what they're seeing as the Messiah ben David. That's right. But they're seeing it as two separate messiahs. Yes, but what's interesting is you see that they, they're already acknowledging this apparent contradiction. So they can't then turn around and say, Jesus can't be the Messiah because he didn't fulfill the Messiah ben David prophecies. How far back did that line of thinking go? Did that go all the way? I mean, the, the Talmud, as we heard at the last episode, was the oral traditions written down. So this was the oral tradition from Moses' day, that there would be the two comings, the two messiahs, or it was really just unpacked in later years? That's actually a very deep question which points up a kind of internal contradiction in the Talmud, uh, which a full explanation may take us a little astray. But in fact, on the one hand, the Jewish teaching is that the Talmud was the oral tradition revealed to Moses. But on the other hand, a lot of the Talmud clearly postdates Moses and in fact refers to rabbis who were not around at the time of Moses and so forth. Uh, the Jewish theology has an explanation for that um, apparent contradiction or, or that contradiction, which is essentially, without going into it in too depth, that the, that the uh, basically the Talmud is inspired by the Holy Spirit and is infallible and that that kind of is used to bridge the chronological um, contradiction there. But it's certainly, I mean, this, this Messiah ben David, Messiah ben Joseph teaching uh, predates Christianity. Interesting. And that would have been known more by the rabbis than by the common Jew, or that would have been known by the common Jew as well. As they were waiting for the Messiah, there would be, they, they knew they were waiting for two? Um, it's a very legitimate question, and my guess is that, of course, the only education you had in those days was theological education, right? I mean, people didn't become civil engineers or computer engineers or whatever. They either did religious study or they, they just were laborers or something. Um, and uh, so I would say probably the, the educated were aware of all of this and the, um, the, the mass of the people were, were probably not even functionally literate and probably weren't aware of this. I found that fascinating in the book because it does tie together 
the Catholic understanding of the second coming. And, and it all fits as only God could make it fit. There was a, um, a section I wanted you to talk about. Uh, again, I found this very interesting. Hatred without cause, the Yoma 9b. It's on page um, 124. Um, yeah, this is, there are all these places where the Talmud confirms Christianity without meaning to. And this is one of them. Um, first of all, you refer to Yoma 9b, which may not be a meaningful term to all of our viewers. The, the Talmud um, is uh, 63, they're called tractates, but essentially 63 books. And so the Yoma is the name of one of the books. And then they're divided into folios, essentially very large pages. So nine is like page nine of the book of Yoma, and B means the second side of the page rather than the first side of the page. Anyway, that's not of terrible interest. And I appreciate that. You bring it up. With the, uh, the books of the Bible, where they were coming from different time frames, is this with the different books of the Talmud? Is there any no, correlation there? No, there's no there, sense of that. Just, they're, they're, they're divided more or less by topic. Okay. So there'll be books that are dedicated to um, the laws of daily life and books that are dedicated to temple worship and to like the Like our catechism of the Catholic yeah, Church. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, in, in the Talmud it says, they're asking why was the temple destroyed in 70 AD? And they say, but why was the temple destroyed? Um, and the answer is, because at, the time of, uh, because at the time there prevailed hatred without cause. Hatred without cause. Now, we know in a sense the temple was destroyed um, because of Jesus, because Jesus came. And um, that phrase, hatred without cause, may sound familiar to Christians because it appears in the New Testament where Jesus at the Last Supper says, um, um, uh, I don't know exactly where to start, but if you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He who hates me hates my father also. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It is to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Yeah, that, that was fascinating when you brought that out. And, you know, hatred without cause did not ring the bell until I, I there was a familiarity that I was trying to find where it was from. And then, again, as you say, so, the Talmud continues. The Talmud even says the temple was destroyed essentially because they hated Jesus without a cause. Was there anything else with uh, this chapter you wanted to touch on that we've missed? Um, well, I'll talk about, since we're talking about the Talmud, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, in particular, this is not exactly, it's, it's, it's indirectly related to the issue of the Talmud, which is that, um, Judaism, when the temple was destroyed, was faced with a tremendous crisis because the entire Jewish sacramental system was oriented around temple sacrifice, around the animal sacrifice. And you couldn't have animal sacrifice without the temple because the only place that animal sacrifice was valid was in the temple. So the uh, entire system for the remission of sins, so essentially the entire system for getting into heaven, was dependent on the remission of sins through animal sacrifice, and you could no longer have animal sacrifice. So in some sense, you could no longer have Judaism. Right. So what are you going to do? Or as they might have said, oy vey, <laughs> what do we do now? We don't have a temple. There's no Judaism left. And so this, the situation was that around 135 AD, uh, the temple was initially destroyed in 70 AD when Jerusalem fell to the Romans. But there was still, after that invasion and, and conquering of Jerusalem by the Romans, some Jewish presence in Jerusalem. And they revolted again um, around 135 AD. And that second revolt was crushed incredibly brutally. And from that point on, the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem under pain of death. And at that point, they knew they were never going to be able to rebuild a temple again. And so what do we do? So the rabbis congregated in, uh, in a place called Javnia. This is referred to as the Council of Javnia. And they developed a system to substitute for the temple sacrifice. Or they pretended, or they claimed to develop a system where animal sacrifice was replaced by almsgiving and prayer and good works. And that became known as rabbinic Judaism as an alternative to temple Judaism. And obviously, the Judaism of the last 
um, 1850 years, 1900 years, has been rabbinic Judaism rather than temple Judaism, which is another argument against the dual covenant theory, which we had discussed earlier. Because the dual covenant theory essentially says, well, God gave the Jews his mechanism of salvation in the Old Testament, and God would never change his mind, so the Jews still have their Jewish mechanism for salvation. They don't need Christianity. Well, even if that were true, the Jews couldn't be using their old mechanism of salvation because the Old Testament mechanism of salvation required animal sacrifice, which the Jews haven't been able to do in 1900 years. So it's entirely moot whether moot meaning irrelevant or un, unenforceable, because even if God was willing to honor the old system, the Jews couldn't honor the old system. Now, you could hardly argue that the Council of Javnia was directly guided by the Holy Spirit and therefore um, a reflection of, like, God's substitute for Judaism, because it was at the Council of Javnia that the um, Jewish Christians were anathemized you know, and, and uh, Jesus was again, you know, uh, condemned as the false messiah. Mm -hmm. So you could hardly argue that that was a council of the Holy Spirit, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. Am I, uh, I'm, I know I'm talking a lot, but there's one other piece here that please, I want to put in, and uh, one other piece of the puzzle, which is I want to talk a little bit about that second Jewish revolt because it says a lot about the early relationship between the Jews and the church. As we see in the book of Acts, um, you know, all, virtually all of the very first um, wave of Christians were Jews who, who became followers of Jesus. At Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 were baptized, all of those were, were Jewish, Jews or Jewish converts. Um, we see in the book of Acts that um, the, those early Jewish Christians were still going to synagogue. You know, they were having the, the Christian liturgy and, and, and the Mass, in fact, on Sundays, but they were still, you know, worshiping in synagogue. Now, they were only thrown out of synagogue and anathemized by the Jewish community. In other words, um, the, the final separation between the early church and Judaism only occurred um, about 100 AD, the final separation. Uh, uh, and why did it occur? It occurred for the following reason, that when, after the Jews lost Jerusalem in 70 AD under the Romans, um, a, a few decades later, it was probably about 130 AD, there arose a false messiah called Bar Kokhba, who claimed to be the promised messiah and that he would overthrow the Roman rule and establish a Jewish kingdom and, you know, bring victory to the Jews and peace to earth. All of the Jewish rabbis around threw their weight behind him and bought into him. The leading rabbi of the day, Rabbi Akiba, when he bought into Bar Kokhba as the messiah, that was it. All of the Jews were unanimous. Bar Kokhba was, uh, was a revolutionary against the Romans, and he called for the armed overthrow of the Roman rule. The only Jews who refused to take up arms in this revolt were the Christian Jews, Christian Jews. because they could hardly throw in with this revolt, because that would mean they were accepting Bar Kokhba as the Messiah, which would mean that they were unfaithful to Jesus as the Messiah. So they were the only Jews who refused to go along and that's when they were anathemized. That's when they were finally thrown out of the temple, uh, synagogue. That's when they became finally persona non grata. So, me as a Jewish Christian, as a Jewish Catholic, right, Jews will turn around and say to me that, um, you know, we reject you because you're the follower of a false messiah. I can turn around and say, no, you reject me because I refuse to become the follower of a false messiah. Because today you admit that Bar Kokhba was a false messiah, and you anathemize the Jewish Christians for refusing to follow a false messiah, not for following a false messiah. I don't know if that was a little bit too convoluted. No, I, I enjoyed that. There was, a, there was another question that I had uh, from chapter 4, and that was with um, the crucifixion and Christ's respect for the, the Jewish priesthood. And we see, you point out some examples in there that I had not seen before. Yeah, that's, it's very beautiful to me as a, as a Jew in the Catholic Church to see, if you read the New Testament through Jewish eyes, you see a lot of truth in there that may escape, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't know Judaism. For instance, one example is when the woman says, if only I touch the fringe of his garment, I know I will be healed. I don't know exactly what, you know, normal Catholics think of what's so special about the fringe of his garment, you know. But to a Jew, that's very telling because 
Jews wear fringes, you know, the, the tallest. You, you see them. The, if prayer you see Orthodox. the prayer shawls have those fringes, and very religious Jews wear them even in secular clothes. And if you walk around a Hasidic community, you'll see the men have these tassels hanging off their pants and out of the bottom of their coats, which are the fringes which are commanded in the book of Deuteronomy, that they shall wear those fringes on the corner of their garments. So the fringe that that woman was touching was a sacramental. It wasn't just because... I don't know what men's clothing has fringes, but I guess, <laughs> um, you know, like, like a Roy Western Rogers thing, is, there you, yeah, go. you know, leather jacket. You know, so you see all of these kind of echoes of Jewish law and Jewish observance, and one of them is in the trial that condemned Jesus himself, itself, which is what you're referring to. You can go through, you can go through Jesus' behavior in that trial and see a lot of reflections of Jewish law, and the one you're referring to in particular is Jesus was refusing to answer Caiaphas, the high priest, and he was accepting being beaten for remaining silent and not answering. And instead of answering his question, he said, I, you know, I have spoken nothing but publicly in the temple. Why don't you ask somebody who, hears, who heard me? And the reason Jesus was doing that is by Jewish law, it was forbidden to compel a witness to testify himself, against himself, right? It's the Fifth Amendment. Fifth Amendment. You weren't allowed to to uh, get a witness to condemn himself, to give testimony against himself. The high priest was commanding Jesus to give witness against himself. Jesus was trying to keep the high priest from sinning. Out of respect for the high priestly office, he was trying to protect the high priest from committing the sin of compelling the witness to testify. And he was even willing to be beaten for that. And he only relented and answered the question when the high priest commanded him in the name of God to answer. And again, then he only relented because of the office of the high priest, that the high priest was, was demanding him to answer. Yeah. And uh, the, the, these um, Jewish Catholics, Jews who became Catholic, the Lehman Brothers, who I have a little section in the book on their like, heroes they live, of mine, they lived in the middle of the um, 19th century, um, they wrote a book analyzing the trial that condemned Jesus bef uh, before the Sanhedrin, and they found over 70 violations of Jewish law in that condemnation, in that trial, any one of which would have invalidated a, um, a uh, verdict of uh, guilty, invalidated a death sentence, any one of those 70. And the Lehman Brothers, we'll probably talk about later in one of the episodes when you talk about the uh, testimonies, but um, just for point of reference here, they were Jewish converts that became priests and were actually at the first Vatican they Council? They were very active. They were, they were twin brothers, Jewish twin brothers, who became priests together, became canons of the church together, and were very uh, active at the first Vatican Council. And maybe if I have a couple of seconds, I'll just say one interesting thing, which is um, they said that they, they studied the Jewish scriptures and they realized that either Jesus was the Messiah and they had to become Christian, or the Messiah hadn't come and wasn't going to come and Jewish scriptures had lied, so they would have to stop being Jews anyway, because according to Jewish scriptures, the Messiah could only come essentially when the temple was still in existence, because the Messiah was going to be from the line of David, and the genealogical records which would establish that required the temple. So if Jesus wasn't the Messiah, there was no Messiah, so there was no point to being Jewish anymore, even if he wasn't. This is fascinating. I appreciate you sharing this. I appreciate the book, and then I appreciate you coming to share. We, we can go so much deeper in understanding our faith, just like this with the uh, Jesus' respect for the priesthood. We, we would not have picked up on that in 21st century Western world. And so it's, it's important that we, we go through this and we learn um, our heritage. And I, I appreciate you doing that and appreciate everybody joining us again uh, with this episode. Um, you, you got an extra week, you didn't have to read a chapter, but next week we'll start the next chapter and we'll, uh, hopefully you'll join us then. Thank you.